what a privilege it is to, to start each day with a prayer and we ask that the Spirit will teach us. You know, if, if I'm here teaching by myself, it won't, won't be a very good class. But if the Spirit's here, we'll do, we'll do so much better. Um, let me just share a thought. Um, this is from President Romney. He said this, he said, when, when earth life is over and things appear in their true perspective, we shall more clearly see and realize what the Lord and his prophets have repeatedly told us, that the fruits of the gospel are the only objectives worthy of life's full efforts. Their possessor obtains true wealth, wealth in the Lord's view of values. I conceive the blessings of the gospel to be of such inestimable worth that the price for them must be very exacting. And if I correctly understand what the Lord has said on the subject, it is. The price, however, is within reach of all of us because it is not to be paid in money or in any of this world's goods, but in righteous living. What is required is wholehearted devotion to the gospel and unreserved allegiance to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There can be no reservation. We must be willing to sacrifice everything. Through self-discipline and devotion, we must demonstrate to the Lord that we are willing to serve Him under all circumstances. When we have done this, we shall receive an assurance that we shall have eternal life in the world to come. Then we will have peace in the world. It's interesting, people think that you'll have peace through, um, you know, through military and things like that, but true peace only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. Let me start today with Wall Street Journal. This is t this morning, Skyler. I can think of better ways to get, you know, sympathy from your girlfriend. Hopefully you're not married. <laughs> You've got an excuse for coming in late. Everyone, okay. Um, this is from Wall Street Journal today. It says, Workings, workers saving too little to retire. Today we start our retirement section. And here's what they said. Workers and employees in the U.S. are bracing for a retirement crisis. New data show that powerful financial and demographic forces are combining to squeeze individuals and companies that are trying to save for the future and make their money last. Here's an interesting statistic. 57% of U U.S. workers surveyed reported less than 25,000 in total household savings and investment, excluding their homes. How long will you last on 25,000? Only 49% 49, 49 reported ha saving so little, ha having so little money saved in 2008. So the difference between 2012 and 2008, we've gone from 49 to 58% or 57%. The survey also found that 28% of Americans have no confidence they will have enough money to retire comfortably. The highest level in the study's 23 history. So how are we doing saving for retirement? The percentage of workers who have saved for retirement plunged to 66 from 75% in 2009. Workers are recognizing there is a crisis. So, and they, they, they use a lot of statistics. If you get a chance, you ought to read the article. But are, are people confident in their ability to save? What do you guys think? Think about your parents. Do you think they're confident? How about the people you know? How many people do you think that are actually out there confident enough that feel they'll have the resources they need in retirement? And if we don't have those, who's responsible? Let's do a another Wall Street Journal survey. We'll just ask some questions, see what you think. Okay, and this, this is from a couple years ago, actually 2008, but the numbers are still Still, <laughs> actually the numbers are getting worse. Okay, among households age 50 plus, how much money is held in a typical retirement account? 90, 140, 190, 240,000. These are 50 plus. Yeah, 90,000. What percentage of workers aged 45 plus said they stopped contributing to retirement savings in the past year? 10%, 15 20%, 25%. That is 2008. It's actually 20%. What percentage of workers surveyed age 45 and older said, based on recent changes in the economy, they have considered delaying retirement? 
24, 34, 44, 54%. Actually, 34%. What percentage of surveyed workers age 45 and older think they are currently saving enough for retirement? 36, 46, 56, 66. 36%, less than a third. Between 1977 and 2007, employment of workers age 65 and order increased how much? 25%, 50, 75, 100%. 100%. Among workers age 65 plus, what percentage work full time? 26, 36, 46, 56. Age 65 plus, what percent work full time? 56%. In 2006, workers age 65 plus accounted for 3.6% of the total work labor force. By 2016, that figure is expected to climb to 4 4.1, 5.1, 6.1, 7.1%. 6.1%. Okay, let's go into some health. How about this one? The average cost of a private room in a nursing home is 58, 68, 78, $88,000. Actually, 78, but right now it's probably 88,000 <laughs> with the inflation. Um, among early retirees who receive health benefits from their former employer, what's the average cost for an individual and family coverage? Individual 16, 26, 36, 46. Family, 8, 9, 10, and 11,000 dollars. It's actually 3,610,000 dollars. No, and I've got a ton of these. Let's do one more. How much did the government pay out in Medicare benefits in 2007? 325 billion, 425, 525, 625, 425 billion. And there's a lot of them. Here's just, we'll just do one retirement here. True or false, when a person reaches age 65 and qualifies for Medicare, his or her spouse, if the spouse is collecting Social Security, also becomes el eligible for Medicare benefits? How many people have a clue? <laughs> and the answer is false, and we'll talk about a number of those things. But, but my point here is, it is clearly, you know, according to the Wall Street Journal, most people aren't prepared. The average person has saved 25,000. And too many times we, yeah, what do you, who do you think you are, the government printing the money? <laughs> you know? and, and the point is, here is, if we don't save, who will? And my purpose here is kind of to scare you a little bit to, uh, to get us to, to do, get, to, to move us to action. Um, Craig Merrill, who teaches in the MBA program, and David Babel from Wharton, they did, they did a, an article, Investing Your uh, sum, Lump Sum at Retirement, and they talk about the perfect storm. I don't know if you guys remember the movie about the perfect storm. <laughs> but um, the, the point of this article stated that retirees must take strategic action with the deployment of their resources and funds as they begin retirement. He says there's five forces coming on. He calls it the perfect storm. Others call it the tsunami wave that's about to engulf us from all sides. And the best we can do is really organize our finances. The best we can do is to take this class and to figure out how we're gonna do it. Because there isn't anything we can do to stop these five forces. And so force number one, decreasing levels and importance of social security benefits. Our current levels of social security are not sustainable. You know, we, we see right now what's going on with negotiations in the house. You know, and, and Republicans are just saying, well, let's just slow it down a little bit. Let's slow it down to 3.4%. And the Democrats, no, let's keep it going at 5%. The point here is there's, there's going to have to come up. Something's going to happen. And what we're realizing is that, the, number one, the decreasing levels and the importance of Social Security benefits in our, um, in our retirement. Number two, the n demise of defined benefit plans. It used to be you work for a company and you work for them all your life and then they would give you a certain amount for the rest of your life. Now those plans have gone, <laughs> have, 
have been uh, you know, basically reduced. It used to be almost a quarter of the people, I think 20 years ago, a quarter of the people had those divine benefit plans, and now it's down to like 3%. Um, in 1983, there was 175,000 of those plans. It's since declined to less than 20,000 of those plans. And so defined benefit pensions are just, for, for most people, are just not there. Number three is the aging of the baby boom generation. So, you know what, I hate to say, my, and I'm, I'm part of the baby boom. You know, we're getting older. We're getting closer to retirement. We're currently 27% of the population and 47% of all households. You know, in the next few years, we're going to be become, become dependent on Social Security. Number four. So generally, they talk about baby boomers. Those are the people born between 46 and 64. And then the post boomers. Those are people born between 65 and 1979. And then all those 1980 and 2001. That those post boomers are going to have the responsibility of not only preparing for themselves, but also supporting all the baby boomers as well. So in 2006, there were 7.2 persons between the age of 18 and 65 for each person over 65. Within the next 23s, that's expected to drop to 3.7. So you're going to have fewer people working to support. And then the last one is the increasing longevity of the American population. Life expectancy is increasing. So we've got a situation where people's money, people haven't saved much for retirement, and then they're living longer. And what does that do? So it says, when considered together with the decreasing yields from bonds and lower returns from stocks in recent years, these forces spell disaster for those who do not take more prudent financial measures to prepare for what is becoming the major financial risk of the 21st century, living too long. So, so the purpose of this introduction is to cause you to think. And we, we talk a little bit about scaring, but these are real factors. This is not <laughs> something that's made up. These are things to be aware. And if we don't prepare for retirement, who will? And that's the thing we, uh, that's the thing we want. Um, let's talk about our retirement. Your personal financial plan. We're going to have this section here on 13. Your retirement goals, how many years till you retire? How much will you need? How much do you have? How much will you need to save annually to reach your goals? And we'll, we'll include teaching tool six. I was amazed at the number of people who've never sat down and thought about how much they need for retirement. I'd also like you to use a copy of your social security statement. We can actually go right online on, on that. Strategies, your action plan, what are strategies for your accumulation? Why do I want you to get a copy of your social security statement? Does that tell you at retirement how much you will get? Would you like to know how little it is? <laughs> so, and it's important for you to understand where you can get it. And uh, so you can see that because that's part of your retirement. Action plan, we divide retirement into three different areas. Your accumulation stage, is between now and when you retire. Your, your retirement stage is what about at the, at the, when you retire and your distribution stage or decumulation stages are how are you gonna take your money in retirement? And so what we wanna do is we wanna have strategies for each of those. And then what are your preferred investment vehicles? We'll talk a little bit about preferred investment vehicles for, for retirement. And you know, when it, when it comes to teaching retirement planning, it's really just three questions. How much do you need? And the question is to retire how you want. I have wonderful examples from, from in my family. One, one set of parents could do whatever their health would allow. And then the second set of parents would do whatever, you know, whatever Social Security and we would help them out with. 
both, are, both were wonderful parents. You know, both of them passed away. Uh, bo both sides have passed away. But, but how do we want to live our life at retirement? Number two, what are the ve vehicles available and how can you use those? You know, we talked about <laughs> Ross and uh, Roth vehicles, and we talked about 401ks and things like that. I had a student who sent me a video. <laughs> Dave Ramsey was talking about the, the challenges with indexed annuities. You know, are they indexed to the stock market? And he says this video, he sent me this video. And the video um, was kind of a rebuttal. And the, 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 the interesting thing was, he says, Brother Sudwicks, what do you think? And I says, well, the life insurance product compares life insurance, which is tax deferred, to a traditional, RO, uh, to, to a traditional product which pays taxes, you know, a tax deferred. It makes no comparison to a Roth product. Oh, and then the, the life insurance one makes an assumption that you have to have life insurance for your entire life. And I says, you know, if you'll take the, add those two things in there, you'll see that, you know, being a wise investment because of the cost of those index annuities. Uh, you can do quite a bit better on those. So just kind of an interesting thing. So, but we need to understand those so we can, make the, we can make the decisions. So we are comparing apples with apples. And then uh, the final one is how do you tell if you're on track to reach your retirement goals? And that's, that's a big one here. And so what we'll do is we'll spend some time today. We'll work, we'll work on each of those things there. Okay. Um, So let's, let's talk about the stages of retirement. I, I define retirement planning into three areas. Accumulation stage. It's between now and, and when you're going to need, you know, n now is the accumulation stage. Accumulate assets you will need. And you, act, you need to develop a plan for that. How are you going to do that? Give me some ideas of plans on how you can accumulate Assets for retirement. Your yeah, your investment plan you just made. What else do we talk about on your budget? How much do we want you to save? 20%. Now you get to decide. I mean, that's just a goal that I give you. Is that's nothing in stone, but it can be it can be important. And you might decide, okay, I'll put 3% of that. So here's some. They take 20% of every dollar, put 10% in the company of one 401k, 5% for retirement, 5% in children's missions and education funds. You know, however you decide to do it. But you need to sit down and make a goal now. I'm speaking at a Utah, North Utah Preparedness Fair. And I came up with the things. It is decide, commit. Now, I don't know if any of you guys see this, you know, P90X, my wife and I got up this morning and did it, you know, and it's, <laughs> and it's, it's decide, commit, succeed is what they do there. And, and I kind of thought about this and I said, you know, really when it comes to personal finance, it's decide, commit, believe, and achieve. It's kind of a little bit different, but, but we need to decide and then we need to commit. And then we'll talk about this, converting friends from traditional 401k IRA into Roth accounts. I have a strategy right now where I actually, I actually um, am converting some of my taxable accounts into Roth accounts. BYU has a Roth 401k, which is a wonderful vehicle. And so what I'm doing is um, not quite living on my BYU salary, but I'm having them take out the maximum amount. And because I'm old, I'm part of the OGC, the Old Geezers Club, that I, can, I actually have a $5,500 supplemental amount that I can put in. But I'm maximizing everything I can in my Roth 401k because that's one of my strategies. So I have a question. I know for like education funds, there's like the 529. So what do you do for a children's mission fund? You, you can't. It has to be a taxable one. And so what do you do with children's missions? Because, because it's taxable, you want something that pays very low tax, has low turnover, low taxes, and I like these index funds. Uh, with my, my kids, what I did is I did an S&P 500 index fund. If I had it to do over, I'd probably do a total market index fund because that would give me both large cap and some small caps as well. So that's the accumulation stage. The second one is retirement. Uh, retirement slash annuitization. What's an annuity? 
Does anyone want to define that for me? Reese. You just get a set amount every year. Right. So you pay a certain amount of money to an insurance company, and, or, and they will guarantee you a certain amount of money every month for, uh, for as long as the contract stays. So um, is annuitizing assets a pretty good idea, at least part of your assets? Probably. So what we want to do is decide how will your assets be distributed at retirement. The risk of what's the risk of taking it all in lump sum? Yeah, taxes is one. And, w w w and inflation. Also, will you have enough to, to last? And so you can annuitize some here. So retirement strategies, one of the things you could do is what's your minimum level of retirement income? Now, this is not to go visit all the grandkids. This is just what you need to survive. So calculate the amounts from your Social Security, any defined benefit plans. Calculate the minimum amount needed to live comfortably. And then you take some of your investment assets, if they're sufficient, and you can actually buy an annuity. Um, and so, and that would give you, that would guarantee a certain amount for the, as long as you live. And then we have distribution, disposition, decumulation strategies. This is after you retire. How are you going to take that? Because what we want to do is we want to, we can minimize our taxes. So, you know, you know about those, those traditional, traditional tax deferred retirement accounts and tax eliminated. We could actually kind of minimize some of those things. Some possible strategies. Take out a maximum distribution of 3.6% each year. Or you could only take out the earnings from the previous year. Or later years when your income's less, you could actually transfer money from your tax deferred to your tax eliminated accounts. So when you think about how much money you're going to be earning when you go on missions. So my wife and I in six years. So we're not going to have much money. Are we going to have expenses? You go on a mission, what is it? A couple thousand a month, you're going to have expenses. What would happen if you actually took some of the money from your tax deferred accounts? How much taxes are you going to be paying on those years that you go out serve missions? Probably a lot less. Transfer those over to Ross at a very low, probably a pretty low tax rate. Jared? I'm just curious, does the church make it so you can go and give them money at retirement to go sit serve a mission and then just like you do nowadays, you put 100 bucks a month or whatever, which is a lump sum, and they kind of give you an annuity to live on? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Not, not for the senior couples. But, but the point here is, is what do you want to do? How do you want to live? And, and the key is to make those plans now, and let's, let's think through those here. So, so that's what we want to do, is we want, we want to think ahead. Um, So one of the things that, that's used often for retirement is annuities. It's a designed to accept and grow funds, and then upon annuit annuitization, it pays out a stream. And these annuities can be structured many different ways. You have to be very careful with annuities because the costs can be huge. So they can be uh, payments for life. So it's, the, the payments will continue for as long as you live. It can be payments for the life of you and your spouse. It can be a duration of payments. It can be 20 years or for life. It can be types of payments, fixed or variables. So an annuities are very flexible instruments. And realize that annuity is an insurance product. But, but realize the more flexible it is, the more the ex expenses are. So we need to be wise with these. Um, what are the different types of annuities? Immediate annuity is you. You put certain money in right now, and the payments begin immediately. Deferred, you put the money in now, and the payments will begin in five years, or 20 years, or when you re reach age 65. A fixed annuity, fixed payments are made, variable based on, variable based on a specific asset's performance, life until the end of the investor's life, period certain for certain things. So there's a lot of different things here with annuities. And then how are they paid out? Single life, 
for as long as you live, life with a certain period, as long as you live. However, if you die before a certain, they'll continue to the end of the period, joint and survivor for you and a spouse, lump sum. Yeah, so there's different ways of taking these annuities, but it's important that we understand annuities. Okay, question. What goes into the decision, the, the retirement planning decision? What are the factors that go into that? Grant, you're, you're going to retire someday. What do you think goes into the decision? <coughs> of like how much I want to have saved up. Or yeah, and how much you want to have saved up. Uh, at what age I want to retire. What age? Other things. Where you want to live. Where you want to live. Oh, oh, how does where you want to live impact you? Taxes and cost of living. Yeah. It's called lack of preparation. I'm not a jock. <laughs> Other things. Your lifestyle. Huh? Lifestyle. Inflation. Inflation. Return. Return. Oh. Now do we see why, why in the investment plan we put an expected return before retirement and an expected return in retirement? Other things? When you die. <laughs> when you die. <laughs> Your health, maybe? Health. The taxes, what's the impact of, of taxes on retirement? It'll depend on, I guess, what your investment, uh, what's it called, the investment strategy is, or what, right. what tools you have. Right, so if you put all your money in tax deferred accounts, are you going to have to pay taxes at retirement? The answer is yes. Here's a question for you. Should you put all your money in a Roth account? Now, question, is, is our tax code, is it progressive or regressive? It's progressive. So you can actually take a certain amount of taxes, you can have a certain amount of income and you pay very low taxes or no taxes on it. So maybe what we ought to do is we ought to figure out what that level should be. So what each of you are going to have to do for this class is you're all going to have to fill out teaching tool six. And so why don't, we, why don't we just do that in class? If you want to pull out your computer, you could do this at the same time. And this is just a fun little spreadsheet. The downside after you filled out this spreadsheet, you're different than, what was the statistic? I, I think only 46% of the people have actually thought about how much they need at retirement. So after you fill out this spreadsheet, you're, <laughs> You're different than 50, 54% of the people. Okay, number of years till, you, till retirement. Can I pick on someone? Someone want to volunteer? Okay, Matt. How old are you right now, Matt? 24. 24, what age are you going to retire? 45. 24, okay. 21 years. 21 years. What was... You know, from your investment plan, what was your growth rate of investments before retirement? Say 8%. 8%? Yeah. Do you remember what it was? What, what was your estimate for inflation? I think between 2 and 3%. Okay, do you want to go 2.5 or do you want to do 3? Let's do 2.5. Okay. How many years are you going to be in retirement? 50. 50 years. <laughs> okay. And what was your uh, expected return in retirement from your investment plan that you just completed? 6%. 6%. And inflation during retirement? 2.5%. And your tax rate in retirement? I don't know. So we say 25? Yeah. Why is it important that we put this tax rate in retirement? Uh, because if 
you have like annuities and you pay in. Okay. Tax deferred, tax deferred accounts as well. Okay. So generally what we'll do what we do is is we just kind of figure out what kind of a lifestyle you want at retirement. So what was your what would be your living expenses and after tax dollars? Now hopefully at retirement your house is paid off. It's an interesting Wall Street Journal article. It said the debt bubble threatens to de derail many, many baby boomers retirement plans. People buy too big of houses, does not give them the resources they need to save for retirement. And uh, their recommendation is, is be careful. So what do you think you're gonna need at retirement after tax? Uh, 100K. 100K. Okay. And the question is how much of that income you wanna replace? Generally they found that once people retire they need about 80% of that income. And that's what research has found. And so, uh, and that's because you don't need the suits and you don't need the, the second car and you don't need all of these other things there. You know, you don't need to go out to lunch every day and things like that. So how much of that do you want to replace? 80%. 80%? Now I did this with my wife and she said, <laughs> I want to replace 110% of it. She says, because I want to visit all the grandkids every year. <laughs> so. That's an important decision. Any other, any other anticipated expenses in retirement? So like my wife put in a little bit of extra so she could visit all the grandkids every year. That's, that's her things. So we'll just leave that there. Okay, so that means we're gonna need 80,000. Your tax rate's 25, so you're gonna need 106,000 a year to accomplish that. And now, but, but the thing you need to take about, Matt, is in 20 years when you retire, it's not going to be 106,000. It's going to be 179,000 a year. So these people who have only saved 25,000, they're going to have a challenge. Okay, let's go. Annual Social Security benefit in dollars. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to put something here just to show, let's say, 12,000. Do you have a, a, do you have a defined benefit plan? Nothing there. And what's, and I, I set up here so we could actually uh, make this grow. We, we could grow it at a different rate than inflation. Do you think benefits are going to grow faster or slower than inflation? Probably slower. And so you're at, you're, you're growing that at two and a half percent. I just put growth rate at 2%. So no, notice, here's what you're going to need. 179,000 a year. Your Social Security, I put in 12,000. That, that would be about 18, so you're going to need about 160,000. You're going to need 13,000 a year. So you're going to need about $3.9 million. So Matt, how much have you saved? Three grand. Three grand. Okay. Now, uh, how much of that is taxable and how much of that is retirement? Um, all is retirement. Okay. And notice you grow that for 21 years. Do you own your home? Do, do you have a home? No. Okay, why do, we add, why do we add a home in here? Well, Sky. Like you have a big house. Family. Yeah. So, you can sell the house and use it. Uh, how about right now? Do you think now's a good time for people who want to retire and sell their homes? No. <laughs> but, but yeah, so there's, there's some assets there too. And how about if you decide, you know, you're going to sell your home and then you're going to buy a condo up at Park City or something like that. Do you need to take that into account? That's part of the financial side. Okay. So he's got 21 years and he's saving for 50 years. He's gonna be retiring for 50 years. Does that match? So guess how much he needs to save a month? $6,000 a month. So I have a question for the inflation. Okay. Uh, so it said like it, at age 45, what $100,000 would be worth. Okay. But the inflation's gonna be dip, like at age 90, 
it's going to be hundred thousand dollars to be different than it is at yeah. forty five. Does it adjust for that? Well, we're just we're, you're, we're just assuming over over this time period. What could we do in this to make it a little bit more interesting? Could we come up with? Could we come up with? Could we use something like Monte Carlo analysis? I'm actually teaching that in, in another one of my classes. We may, we may have a thing where you could actually come up here and say, well, my expected return is a log normal return. My average is 8%, but it's probably got a, you know, this type of a distribution. My inflation, I think, is going to be this. That'll be a normal return. And let's run 3,000 iterations and kind of see what our amounts are. Could we use something like Monte Carlo simulation to kind of help us to do this type of work? The answer is yes. Do we have the tools? If anyone would like an add-in um, for Monte Carlo simulation add-in, uh, we've, we've got one. Um, we've got permission to use one that, that you could do that. But, but there's a lot of room for tools and these type of things here in this type of analysis. So let's go through and just take a look at it. I, I want to make a, a point here. I'm going to split this screen here. Notice he needs 5,000. What's the impact of inflation there? Notice if inflation there, he's going to need 6,000 a year. Notice if I put 2%, he dropped from, we've dropped a half a percent inflation from, from 2.5 to 2. What did it drop from 6,000 down to 4? Let's, let's take a little bit easier thing. Now, now notice what happens if we, we just take what, what Matt has put us. Let's say instead of 45, let's say he goes to 55. And instead of 50, he goes to 40 years. Notice now what happens. Now we're, now we're at 2,000 or 30,000 a year. What happens if... Matt decides instead of, he really doesn't need 100000 because his house will be paid off. What if he only needs 50000 and he'll, we'll take that at 100%. Excuse me. You know, let's say 50,000 and he does 100%. Notice that this is around 18,000. Is that just filling his 401k? Yeah. So the nice thing about this tool is we, it allows you to be basically go through and answer different questions. It allows us to answer what happens if we do it. Now, what happens if inflation goes to three? Notice he's roughly 17,000. Inflation goes to three, it goes from 17,000 to 28,000. Is that a huge impact? And the answer is yes. Um, let's also ask one more question. What happens if instead of 6%, he's able to get 7%? And that brings it on down. So a, a lot of variables that are going into this. But most people have not sat down and thought about this. Most people haven't thought about how much they need we, we kind of tend to think, well, I really want that car. I really want that, you know, this, this new expensive car. And I really want this really nice house. And really, there's a lot of things. You may get that new expensive car. But is that going to give you the flexibility you need to accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish? The people who accomplish the goals are the, will, the ones who are willing to give up what they want now for what they want most. There's a scripture in D&C 4334. It says, let the solemnities of eternity rest on your mind. You know, what are the solemnities of eternity? And I'd say, we can change that. Let your long-term goals rest on your mind. Does it feel good to be able to, to say that, you know, come retirement, we can do whatever we want? And the answer is yes. Is it a good feeling to know that you have the resources for your kids so that if they will put their part in, they can graduate without debt. Yes, is it good to know that your kids have the money for missions? My wife didn't serve a mission because her parents, she felt her parents couldn't afford it. We said our children would never have that, yes. And, and so, so the key is to make the decisions now. And probably the most important decision you guys will ever make is that 20%. The decision to how much are you gonna save? 
the decision to live on a budget, to the decision to save. And that's probably the most important thing. Let's, let's do a... Let's do a case, a case. Okay, got this couple. They reviewed their fut future income expense projection. They're gonna retire in 25 years. So, and they figured out that based on how much money they have in their, their accounts, they would, get, they would have 25,000 a year. So 10,000 from Social Security, 15,000 from savings. But they would actually need 67,500. How much do they need to save annually for 30 years of retirement if they want to meet their income projection, assuming 2% inflation rate both before and after retirement, 8% return on investments before retirement, and 7% after retirement. Could we figure this out? Okay, so let's talk about how we do this. So, so let's, let's talk about how you, how you calculate this. And so the first thing we want to do, I'm going to show you how to do it. And then, then we'll have you do it. So first thing I do is on these type of problems, I draw a diagram. This is, this is now. <laughs> this is when you retire, and this is when you die. <laughs> it's not the most exciting diagram. <laughs> so, but that's first. So we draw, draw the diagram. Second thing we do is put in our return. OK, we're going to make 8% on return until retirement. Inflation's 2%. In retirement, we're going <coughs> to make 7%. Okay, so the first thing we do is we calculate the shortfall. What's the shortfall? Right, so how much we're short from between what we want and what they've got. How much, how much do they want? 67.5. How much do they have? 25. And so what are they, what's their shortfall? That. Second thing we want to do is we want to inflation adjust the shortfall. So we know how much they have now. How do we inflation adjust that shortfall? So we use our inflation number. So that would, that would tell us how much they're going to need at retirement. The third step is we calculate the real return in the annuity. How do we calculate the real return? Fact, first, so what's the real return in retirement? You guys remember the formula? We talked about that. What's the correct way to do it? Joni? Right, right now we're not worrying about taxes right here. So how do you calculate the real return? Is it 7 minus 2? Two? 2, does that give you a 5%? It's 1.07. One one po <laughs> Good job, Grant. 1.07 divided by 1.02 minus 1. And what's the real return there? About 4.9%. And then we calculate the annuity. So we'll, we'll know what that payment, how much we're going to need every month. We'll know what the interest rate, the real return is, and we calculate the annuity. And then the last one is we calculate the period payment. So do you think you could do that? So calculate the shortfall. Inflation adjusts the shortfall. Calculate the real return in the annuity and then calculate the, pay, the period payment. How much you're going to have to save each year or each month to, to accomplish that. Okay, let's get together in our groups. Get together in our groups and let's take, take five minutes and put this together. If you have a question, raise your hand. Okay, let's just kind of take you, take you through it here. 
The reason I like to draw the diagram, it's so I don't forget things. And what I do is, so first of all, I'll calculate the shortfall. And when I calculate the shortfall, what do I need to use? I use this inflation number and I use that. So then I cancel that out. My second thing I do is inflation adjust the shortfall. So, oh, excuse me, calculate, uh, inflation adjustment, I cross that out. Third thing, calculate the real return. I use those two and my annuity and then I use that and then I calculate the period payment. So then I use that piece there. So when I write the diagram, it helps me to make fewer mistakes. So let's go through. Oh, okay, sorry. So calculate the shortfall. So what we do is we just subtract 67.5 minus your 25,000 and so we get our 42,500. So does that make sense? That's the difference between what we have and what we, what we need. And then we inflation adjust that shortfall. So our 42.5 is our present value. Our, our interest rate is our inflation. Number of years is 25, we'll solve for our future value. And so they're gonna need almost 70,000 a year in retirement. Step number three, calculate your real return. Now realize that the correct way to calculate your real return is one plus your return divided by one plus inflation minus one. And then what we wanna do, so our real return is 4.9%. And then what we wanna do is calculate an annuity so at retirement, if they want, they could go out and purchase this annuity, which would give them the amount that they need. So 69,726 for 30 years at a 4.9% return. We'll set this to our payment, n is to 30, i equals 4.9, and solve for present value. And so we need $1.1 million. And then that brings us to the last thing. So we need $1.1 million at retirement we have to calculate our period payment, so set our future value to 1.1 million, n equals 25, i equals 8%, calculate our payment. So they'll need about 15.5 each year to meet that retirement goal. So if they just fill their 401k each year, should that help them do it? Would they be able to accomplish it? And the answer is yes. So you don't use the real return on the four? The no, we don't, because we use the inflation on the, on the first half of it. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Let's do another problem. So again, the questions are, how much are you gonna need at retirement? What are the available vehicles to help you accomplish that? And how do you tell if you're on track? So Kevin and Whitney are now 45 years old. They have six kids, 20 years into their retirement plan, 115 in savings. They've got 115,000 in savings they're doing five times better than the Wall Street Journal article today. So the remaining balance on their home, mortgage and some credit card debts, 150,000. They saved 5% a year and they've earned 7% on their savings and felt that was good. Are they on track for retirement? Calculate their income slash debt ratios from the Wall Street Journal. How are they doing? First of all, how are they doing? They're doing five times better than the art people in the article. They're doing what? They're going to have challenges. Um, there was an article that came out in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and it was Jonathan Clements, and it was 23rd May of 05, page uh, D1. And it says, ugly math, how so soaring housing costs are jeopardizing retirement savings. Why don't you guys read this? There's, there's, there's two pages to it. But it's an interesting way of looking at the savings in the housing question. Hopefully the Wall Street Journal won't give me a bad time, you know, <laughs> for including their article on this. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the second page. Mm -hmm. 
What do you think? So tell me what the article is proposing. My question is, how do we know if we're on track? What's, the, uh, what's Jonathan Clements proposing? So the amount of savings to the amount of debt that we have. Um, so calculations are on the track. You really can't tell until, until you see it. Age 45, salary is 82. So notice with their savings, savings ratio, they're at 1.4. Is that good or bad? Where do they want to be? Greater than three. Debt ratio 1.83, they want to be less than one. And the question is, they're way behind on this. Um, applications. You know, if, if retirement's really a goal, If retirement's really a goal, they, they need to be saving more. Um, what should they be doing? Too much debt. Not been saving enough, they begin to save a larger percentage. Um, are these, let, let's go back to his assumptions. Are the assumptions consistent? progress is, you know, what does the framework tell us? There's a reality check. There's a relationship between earnings and debt. And, and we need to do both. We need to be reducing debt at the same time we're increasing savings. Here's his assumptions. Investors will earn 5% more than inflation. Matthew's assumption of 7% and then 2% inflation, was he consistent with that? Probably. Investors will save 12% of pre-tax income every year from 30 to 65. What do you guys think about that? Hopefully they do. What do you think most investors save? If you're saving 20% of gross income, what's that of, of pre-tax income? You're probably 20, 24, 25. Investors will withdraw 5% of a portfolio of value each year. What do you think? So, you know what, and those are interesting assumptions. So, uh, hopefully you'll earn over 5%. You know, people will save 12%. Hopefully you guys will save significantly more. You know, but, but overall the guidelines are likely to be too soft. Would it be nice to have, would it be nice to have a tool to help you to make this kind of analysis? And so this is learning tool 25. And what I've done is the challenge is, is we don't, you know, usually as LDS, we go on missions, so we marry a little bit later. Or maybe not, maybe we marry earlier. <laughs> but, but we have other expenses. Matt, can I continue to pick on this? Yeah. What's your age at beginning of appointment? In fact, maybe I'll pick on someone else. Someone else want to do this? <laughs> okay. Parker. 23. Twenty-three. Starting income. Uh, Forty-five. Average increase in income. Two uh, percent. Yeah, Age of retirement. Sixty-five. And estimated annuity payment. So we say four percent. And years in retirement. Thirty. Thirty. Okay. What per, well, let's, let's put the amount of percent of your salary saved. Okay, return on investment, what did you have before retirement? Uh, 6%. Before, before, before retirement? Before, uh, 8%. Okay. Assumed inflation, we say 2%. Okay, what age are you going to purchase your first home? Okay. Okay, now, 
Now what I've done here is I'm using the, the ratios, the, the front end ratios, the 28 percent. So if you put it too high, a, too high a price there, it won't allow you. So 250,000. Well, let's say we do. Uh, uh, <laughs> so you can do 200,000 with a 20 20 percent down payment. Mortgage interest rate, let's say four percent. So what, what's the, so I'm just, uh, so I put these, these things here. I just don't want you to spend too much on it. So you could do 200,000 taxes uh, and insurance. Taxes a lot less. Let's go like 120,000. Okay. So this would probably, again, anything green you put in mortgage term. And so now we've got a couple of options. So what we can do, we can either pay off the house or we can, we can save money for investments. And so now watch, watch what happens. At 5% and this mortgage house, he will be at 9.76%. He'll pay his house off there. What happens if he decides to pay his house off in 20 years? or 25 years, notice now, now the money went toward the house, but it didn't go to the investments. So things like that. But let's, let's put, I'm gonna go back here to, to 200,000 in 30 years. So notice what this does by, at 5%, he'll only be to 9.776. At 10%, Will that do okay for him? Huh. What happens if he does 20%? Total savings at retirement, $4 million. The, my point here is just to show, again, what are all of these things? These are just tools. And, and the key is we need to be wise in the use of the tools. If you don't save for retirement, no one will. And so, so let's kind of summarize what we've talked about. Uh, number one, we talked about the Wall Street Journal article today. You know, 56% of people have only saved $25,000 for retirement. 56%. And so people are not taking retirement seriously or they're, they're not making that a priority. We talked about Craig Merrill's paper on um, investing your lungs, lump sum there is a perfect storm coming. Decreasing levels and importance of Social Security. The demise of defined benefit plans. Aging baby, baby boom generations. The emergence of the post boomers. And the increasing longevity of the American population. And all of those are going to come together to say there's just not, unless people start saving for it, the, the resources are not going to be there. We talked about retirement planning. We talked about what are the th three questions it asks. How much do I need? What are the available retirement vehicles and how do I tell if I'm on track? We talked about the three stages of retirement, you know, which is accumulation, retirement or annuitization, and decumulation or distribution. And what we want you to do is each of you to come up with, with strategies in each of those areas. And I shared some of mine. My wife's and I's strategy in the accumulation stage was to save between 20 and 35%. Now, I hate to say it, once we came back to BYU teaching, we, <laughs> we didn't quite do that. But, but that was one of our strategies. Our, our strategy for the decumulation stage, well, uh, one of our, another one of our strategies right now is we're trying to convert taxable assets into Roth assets. So even though we're, we're not saving our whole full amount, we're actually having the, taking out the Roth 401k, the whole 23,000 a year because I'm old and I can do that. But that's our strategy. We're trying to convert assets to, to Roth vehicles. And then we have a strategy on a decumulation. When we go on our missions, what are we gonna do? Since we're not gonna be having much income, that's gonna be a time we'll actually convert more of our, def our uh, deferred retirement plans into Roth plans there. So we talked about factors that go into, we talked about annuities. 
And we talked about ideally what you want to do is you want to annuitize some minimum amount. You know, the amount that you need, just a minimum, just a, you're kind of a, a minimum amount. So as long as you live, you'll at least have that amount. And then we talked about what factors go in, your age and your risk and your expected return and inflation, where you're going to live, your houses. Um, and finally, we talked about how do you monitor it. We did, we did this problem. The, problem num the first one we did is a good problem. It'll probably be on a quiz or something like that, just a hint. But so it'd probably be nice to know it, but how do you do it? Calculate the shortfall. Inflation adjusts the shortfall. Calculate the expected return, excuse me, your real interest rate and your annuity, and then calculate your period payment. And then we talked about that article, how do you tell if you're on track? And again, that article is a good one. However, it might be a little bit not stringent enough. And the key is for us to figure out what do we want to accomplish? Again, like we said at the beginning, it's decide, commit, and I believe, believe and achieve. And if we can make those decisions, set good goals and work on this, we can retire and we can accomplish the things that we need. Thanks everyone.